In this video, we're going to analyze failure of beams due to compressive buckling. We will derive the Euler column formula. We'll apply that formula to various end conditions. And we'll look at the Johnson short column formula and see how it is applied. So when we have axial compression, columns can fail for, one, for two reasons. One reason is simply because they're compressed beyond how they could handle it. So in other words, the stress induced in the column has exceeded the compressive strength of the column. But they also can fail because of buckling. And this occurs, this is a geometric constraint of the column. So if the column is especially very um, long and um, and you apply a force to the end of it, the column has a tendency to buckle in the middle. So in order to decide what we mean by the word long, we're going to uh, establish a slenderness ratio. That's the length divided by a radius of gyration, which is k. And the radius of gyration is related to i, the uh, moment of inertia of the cross section, the, the smallest area moment of inertia of the cross section, and a the area at that particular i. So that i divided by a is, uh, the square root of that is the radius of gyration. So with those as our definitions, let's consider what happens when the load begins to buckle. So what we're looking at here is a beam with an axial load, compressive axial load, that has begun to buckle. And so we notice that there is a distance here that we'll call y between p, the axial response, um, and so that's going to generate a moment about that center point. So the moment is equal to p times y. So the beam equation for small deflections looks like this. This is how we've been finding what deflections are. So m, which is a function of y from above, is equal to the second derivative of y with respect to x. So substituting this equation for m into the beam equation gives us a differential equation. And now we can use this equation and solve, so we have two constants, C1 and C2, those come from our boundary conditions. If we set boundary conditions to be a pinned um, column, in other words, that there is no movement in the x or y direction here at the base at the column and also at the top of the column, if that's true, so y of 0 is equal to 0 and y of L is equal to 0, plugging those into this differential equation y, we'll get the Euler column formula, which can be stated two ways. One is in terms of the critical load. This is the load, P critical, that causes the moment to occur. Or, if we divide by area, so this is in terms of a stress, now we can substitute in um, E is, a, is the strength of the column, so the material properties of the, of the column. And this slenderness ratio now um, helps us understand how slender this column is relative to other columns. So both of these equations are equivalent. In other words, P critical in this equation is identical to P critical in this equation. We've just rearranged them, the terms to make them a little bit more uniform. So if this is our solution now, now we can consider what would happen if um, maybe we have a pinned joint down here at the bottom, but maybe we're doing something different up at the top. So here are five different end conditions. And let's just kind of walk through. If we have a rounded end and a rounded end, it's going to function basically as if it's pinned and pinned. So they have basically the same response. If you've ever stood on top of a, off, on top of a cantilevered post that's freestanding in the air, it's much easier to make this one buckle, so it has a great deal more deflection. Then we could have a fixed at the bottom and pinned at the top, and finally two fixed end conditions. 
So rather than resolving the equation every time, what has been established is an effective length. And that way we can keep the same equations. We still have P critical, and now we're dividing by the effective length. If we redefine our slenderness ratio as an effective length divided by our radius, our, uh, radius of gyration, we then can have um, the equation in terms of the critical stress. And so that allows us, using uh, Table 4.4 in Pearson's book, uh, allows us to just read off what our effective lengths ought to be. So notice some differences here. We have a theoretical value. This is how we would expect things just looking at the differential equation. Turns out when you really build it, that's not quite what happens. And so AISC recommends these values for L effective. And then if we wanted to be extremely conservative, we could use these values for, um, for our L effective. So this is great, and this will work well for various end conditions for long, for very thin columns and tall, and tall. So this is the condition in which buckling has occurred. If you recall, the other way things fail is if they, instead of buckle, if they actually yield. So if we look at this graph, we just defined the Euler line here, this is this curve. And again, we've stated that the critical is uh, the critical load divided by the area is equal to pi squared e divided by the slenderness ratio. So that's this curve. At some point, we would recognize if it was very, very short, the reason it would fail is because we actually compressed the material. So this is the yield compressive strength of the material. So that's what this line is. This is nothing but. P divided by A. So that's this line here. But it turns out, in reality, there is a zone right here where we know in practice things fail before Euler's line anticipates them failing. And that's called the Johnson line, and it's been expressed as <coughs> a curve fitting. And basically, all this equation is doing is drawing an arc from the compressive yield strength of the material to half of the compressive yield strength of the material, which turns out to be tangent to the Euler curve at that location. That's all this curve is. It's just a geometric entity to, to create a curve um, connecting point D here and point A. And so what we now can do is we can divide our column into one of two regions. Either it's in the Euler region, where this equation dominates, or it's in the Johnson region, where the Johnson equation dominates. And to find that equation, to find which region I'm in, what we need to do is we need to calculate the cutoff point. So the cutoff point is a slenderness ratio that tells us exactly when that switch is going to happen. And you can find it from either equation. What we're going to do for P critical over A, what we're going to put in for that value is the yield compressive strength of the material divided by 2. So if we put in SYC over 2, in for P critical, and solve for SR, this will give us the SR that determines whether or not our column is an Euler column or a Johnson column. Then we'll take our particular column and we'll see which side of the slenderness ratio it falls on. If it's in the Euler region, we'll use the bottom equation. If it's in the Johnson region, we'll use the Johnson equation to determine whether or not the particular load we have on our column is enough to cause buckling.